Hello, and welcome to this lecture entitled Labor in the Gilded Age. With industrialization during the Gilded Age, we see a new nature of work. Workers went from being independent producers to being employees. Now, there were some benefits of being an industrial employee. It was easier to gain entry to higher paid work. Albert Reese, for example, estimated that hourly wages increased from 1890 to 1914 by 28% and that per capita income increased from 237 to $482 between 1870 and 1900. Coupled with deflation, this made the purchasing power uh, even greater of these increased wages. Industrial work was an alternative to farm labor for men, and it allowed women to enter occupations other than domestic work. There were new kinds of jobs also. Now, there were, of course, detriments to industrial labor, the most telling of which is proletarianization of labor, that is, the de-skilling of labor by dividing jobs into component parts and turning people into mere machine operatives. Another detriment was strict discipline. Another was the quick pace of work that was driven by the pace of the machines and exceptionally long hours. Now, prior to the Industrial Revolution, the second Industrial Revolution of the Gilded Age, that is, workers worked long hours, but they tended to break those hours of work up. With the new nature of work, we see specialization in the development of economic sectors throughout the economy. We see the development of the industrial sector that split away from the commercial sector, that split away from the service sector. We also see the development of economic classes. The laboring or working classes became blue collar, or were called blue collar. Service workers and management became white collar and there was a division between the working class and the middle class. There was also uh, a recognized ownership class. Now let's talk a little about this middle class because it becomes important during the progressive era. The middle class was uh, defined by its work that was genteel and clean, not particularly physically taxing, and at least moderately well paid. Edwards, for example, cites telegraphers and professionals as typical of the new middle class. Let's look at this graph concerning the classes and the masses. If you follow the blue, kind of purplish um, graph points, the columns in the graph, you'll see that from 1870 to 1910, there was a decrease in proprietors. If you follow the light purple, you'll see there was a growth in clerks. And if you follow the professionals in light blue, kind of greenish, you'll see that there was a growth in professional occupations as well. These changes accompanied a shift in control of production. Workmen typically controlled production in the pre-industrial workshop culture. Then foremen began to control gang jobs like steel production. Foremen bid for jobs at factories, then hired crews through the so-called shape-up, and then he paid them himself. This was a form of subcontracting. Eventually, management took control of production in the early 20th century through both scientific management and the development of personnel managerial bureaucracy. How did labor respond to this change in work life? They formed labor unions in many cases. Now there were two general types of labor unions, the industrial union and the skilled craft union. The Knights of Labor 
were the first national union in the United States. They formed in 1869 as a secret society under a fellow named Uriah Stevens, who is not pictured here, grew during the depression of the 1870s and had a very progressive agenda, an anti-capitalist agenda um, of industrial rather than craft organization, seeing all workers uh, who made wages as being similarly situated and standing in opposition to capital. They asked for state and federal labor bureaus. They wanted to eliminate convict lease as competition uh, uh, for wage labor positions and also as a uh, convict lease was a way to keep wages down. It was also inhumane in their minds. They wanted to inflate the currency that we'll talk about l a little bit later on. They also wanted what's called mechanics lien laws. These would allow employees to be paid first rather than creditors when a business failed. They also wanted equal pay for equal work regardless of gender and they focused on creating cooperative stores. After 1879, their leader, the president uh, and, and master uh, craft, craftsman was Terence Powderly in the upper picture here, sporting what probably won the, the best mustache award for the entire 19th century. Powderly believed in boycotts rather than strikes and consequently he failed to support strikers adequately, causing many strikes to fail uh, over the course of the life of the Knights of Labor. Membership in the Knights of Labor peaked in 1886 at 702,000 and then declined after the Haymarket Affair that we'll talk about in a minute. Another more important union developed in 1884-85 called the American Federation of Labor. Now the AFL was a federation of craft unions in which skilled workers joined together um, to the exclusion of laborers and uh, people in unskilled machine operative jobs. The AFL eschewed radical political activity and focused on collective bargaining and union recognition. Samuel Gompers was its president and leader from 1886 until 1924 when he died. You see him in the uh, picture to the far right. He actively campaigned for labor, labor legislation and he actively campaigned for labor-friendly candidates. He believed that labor's basic interest was in the correct distribution of capitalism's basic product, which was wealth. The AFL became the largest union in America, with 500,000 members in 1900, growing to 2 million in 1914, and by 1920 had doubled in size to 4 million. By 1920, the AFL began to incorporate some industrial unions, which would lead in the 1920s and 30s to some friction within the AFL, ultimately in the mid-1930s, uh, creating the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, that split away from the AFL to merge and then merge back with the AFL in 1955 to become the AFL-CIO that we know today. There was a third way, and this was exemplified by the Industrial Workers of the World, the IWW, that was founded in 1905 and flourished from 1905 until about 1920. The IWW was not particularly concerned with gaining a, a distribution of the wealth of capitalism, nor was it particularly concerned with trying to work out labor's uh, place within a capitalist society. No, it was a revolutionary union that took the hardest of the uh, laboring class and pitted them or reflected their pitting against the so-called capitalist class. The IWW, known as the Wobblies, were anarchists, they were syndicalists and they were socialists. 
They believed in industrial unionism on steroids. They had grown out of the Western Federation of Miners in 1893, and they organized marginal workers like timber workers and migrant farm workers and immigrant workers in the industrial northeast that neither the Knights of Labor, which had failed by 1886, nor the AFL wanted anything to do with. They were led in this by their longtime president, William Big Bill Haywood, pictured here. His biggest success was the Lawrence Textile Strike in 1912, but began failing immediately afterwards with the Patterson, New Jersey Textile Strike of 1913. During World War I, the United States passed laws against syndicalism, the basic belief of the IWW, and made it a criminal offense, a felony, to espouse syndicalism. Haywood was slated to be arrested along with a bunch of other anarchist radicals, and he escaped arrest and then fled to the new Soviet Union, where he died in 1928. Going back to the Gilded Age proper, a new tactic that defined how laborers responded to the industrialization of the Gilded Age was strikes. Let's look at four strikes that are telling and indeed iconic in the labor history of the Gilded Age. These are the Great Railroad Strike of 1877, the Haymarket Affair of 1886, the Homestead Strike of 1892, and the Pullman Strike of 1894. We'll just take them in order here. Looking at the Great Railroad Strike of 1877, this was the first interstate strike in U.S. history something beyond merely a local walkout. The cause was wage cuts during the depression of the 1870s by the major lines in the east and it began on July 17, 1877 with a spontaneous strike at the Martinsburg, West Virginia area of the B&O Railroad. Wildcat strikes occurred all up and down the lines outside of the northeast and the south and ad hoc local councils of rail unions tried to coordinate cross-country strikes. The, this was helped by telegraphers who were kind of the leading edge of the call for strikes and the spread of these wildcat strikes into the first interstate strike in U.S. history. Now the most vocal cohort of these strikers were the socialists. They were the most organized. They have provided the most leadership and the public voice of the movement. On July 20th, 1877, just three days after the strikes began, rioting crowds in Pittsburgh and Baltimore burned roundhouses of the railroads where the engines were turned around. Pittsburgh and Baltimore were important hubs and when those roundhouses burned, they were no longer hubs, and so the rails basically shut down. Workingmen's committees took over the government of St. Louis for a few days before being put down by troops recently released from reconstruction duty in the southeast. Now, the Great Railroad Strike of 1877 brought to mind to many people who were not directly involved in the strike or, or who were against the strike, the 1871 Paris Commune, which was a big shock to capitalists uh, throughout the Western world that revolutionaries who were anti-capitalists for the most part could take over a city the size of Paris. This was in the aftermath of the, the Franco-Prussian War that France lost and was a uh, put down fairly rapidly by uh, troops of the French army storming into Paris, fighting in the barricades in the streets and either killing outright or later executing up to 20,000 so-called communards. But thereafter, this was the revolution that most uh, Americans thought these uh, strikes were bringing to the United States. A few years later, in 1886, was the Haymarket Affair. The Knights of Labor had been leading a movement for the eight-hour day since 1884. Eight hours for work, 
eight hours for sleep, eight hours for what we will, was their motto. The Knights of Labor had focused on the McCormick Reaper factory in Chicago, press this eight-hour day movement, and at a May 1st, 1886 rally, two workers were killed. This is why May 1st is looked upon outside of the United States as International Labor Day. It was picked up by the communists of the Second International. In response to this, and in protest of it, Anarchists called a protest rally on May 4th to occur in the Chicago Haymarket. As this uh, rally was breaking up, the, the Haymarket Square was packed with people, and eight speakers had talked and finished, and the crowd was starting to disperse when police basically invaded the Haymarket, demanded that the assembly was illegal and to disperse, there was words exchanged, and all of a sudden a bomb went off, basically a pipe bomb. The police pulled out their guns. The people in the square pulled out their guns. A, a shootout occurred in which eight policemen were killed, and an untallied number of demonstrators were either killed or wounded. In the aftermath of this Haymarket affair, Haymarket riot, as it came to be called, anti-radical and anti-immigrant hysteria ran rampant often supported by businessmen who wanted to break various unions. There was mob and vigilante violence as well as police repression that did indeed suppress radical anti-capitalist dissent and labor unionism. At trial, seven of the eight anarchist leaders were sentenced to death, including Albert Parsons, born in Montgomery, Alabama, whose wife Lucy Parsons seen here went on to found the IWW, the Wobblies, in 1905. There were repercussions against the Knights of Labor, and as we said when talking about the Knights of Labor, its membership peaked in 1886 and then plummeted after uh, the Haymarket uh, affairs. Um, in the aftermath, this wrecked the anarchist movement as well as the uh, Knights of Labor movement, and there had been a so-called propaganda of the deed um, kind of terrorist movement under a fellow named Johann Most, and this wrecked the propaganda of the deed methodology as well. Let's look now at some of the Haymarket riot um, images. You can see starting in the upper right, these are the, um, uh, the anarchists who were sentenced to death. Uh, Albert Parsons is the thin mustachio man uh, off on the left at the very top. Uh, one of the policemen who was killed is uh, down below. You see the uh, various newspaper scenes, uh, drawings, the hospital, the riot itself, the, um, the bomb going off in the lower corner, and then in the somewhat purplish uh, image uh, in the upper left, that's Governor John Altgeld, who a few years after this uh, commuted the sentences of the remaining unexecuted uh, Haymarket anarchists. Let's look now at the Homestead Strike of 1892. Homestead was a company town outside of Pittsburgh that made Carnegie Steel under local president Henry Clay Frick. Frick, you see here, is the fully bearded fellow. Frick locked out the union workers after they refused to accept the last contract that he offered them, which included getting rid of the union, on June 29, 1892. Frick then proceeded to have a fence built around the plant, so workers and the newspapers began calling the plant Fort Frick. Frick hired Pinkerton detectives to bring strike breakers in, and the Pinkertons had difficulty getting through the mass of pickets outside of the fence, and so they tried to float down the Monongahela River and they tried to enter Fort Frick by floating down the Monongahela on July 6th. They wanted to prepare the place to reopen it with strike breakers. What ensued was that the strikers got wind that these guys were coming downstream in barges, there were about 300 of these so-called detectives, and they sent boats up, gunfire was exchanged, and the tugboat left the barges in the river uh, to take wounded men back. 
and to get the hell out of there. This stranded about 300 of these uh, Pinkerton detectives and left them at the mercy of the strikers who then exchanged gunfire with them for most of the day. This was called the Battle of the Monongahela, and though it was a victory for the strikers in that the Pinkertons surrendered and agreed to go back where they came from, at least to go back upriver and not to enter Fort Frick, it was really not any big help to the strike because it frightened the public and fed the sensationalism of the newspapers. It also gave the governor a reason to send in the militia, and the commander of militia made no bones about siding with the owners and imposing martial law that helped ultimately to break the homestead strike. Eventually the strike played out, it began to fail, when the AFL refused to support it and when workers began to dribble back into the plant in September. The strike was over in November when the union voted to return to work without a contract, consequently uh, breaking the union. Now on July 23rd, as a consequence of strike breakers being able to get into the plant eventually because of martial law and because of a general hatred and his particular hatred of Henry Clay Frick, a Russian immigrant in New York, a guy named Alexander Bergman, shown here in the upper right, attempted to assassinate Frick on Saturday, July 23rd. He failed, he was apprehended, and imprisoned for a long stretch of time, and then he was deported. Now, Berkman's importance, in large part, stems from his close relationship with his paramour, Emma Goldman, also known as Red Emma, pictured here uh, at the bottom of this slide, who was a well-known anarchist. In fact, in the 1900s, Emma Goldman was used by parents as a boogeyman to scare their children into behaving. If you don't behave, Emma Goldman will come and get you. Um, she, of course, was not like that. But um, uh, Berkman was motivated uh, in large part by the rhetoric of other anarchists like um, Goldman, and she was accused of, of being a conspirator with him, but it was never proven in court, so she was not uh, tried or sentenced. Um, here is a picture from the newspaper of the Great Battle of Homestead, the Monongahela River Battle, and of course this strike failed um, as well. The last of the strikes that we want to look at are the, is the Pullman Strike of 1894. Pullman, like Homestead, was a company town. This one was outside of Chicago, and instead of making steel, it made the new Pullman railroad cars. These were sleeper cars that made it possible for people to relax and sleep on long train trips across the country. An 1893 depression led Pullman himself to cut wages, but not to cut rents in the town. And the American Railway Union led this strike under Eugene Debs, who asked for arbitration of grievances, but was refused by the Pullman Company. Consequently, the railway union workers refused to handle Pullman cars on trains, and then refused to handle any trains that were hauling Pullman cars. Railroad solicited help from the federal government by hitching mail cars to Pullman cars. President Grover Cleveland sent in federal troops to run the trains above the objections of Governor Altgeld, who advocated for the state's rights not to have the federal government intervene in this local dispute. This strike failed, and the result of the strike was that a court a federal court used an injunction against the strike. The, sh the federal courts held that the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 applied to unions, and in fact, it was used thereafter more on unions than it was on corporations, that is, until the Clayton Act of 1914. And Eugene Debs was imprisoned for six months for not obeying the first injunction against uh, the um, American Railway Union, and he emerged from jail as a committed socialist later in 1912. 
he would run for president and actually gain uh, almost a million votes, which was pretty big for that time. The Pullman strike, here you see some images from the Pullman strike. Uh, the upper left is uh, George Pullman. Uh, the center bottom is Eugene Debs from Terre Haute, Indiana. And then there is a trooper guarding the rails um, in, in uh, the Pullman strike. Let me summarize this whole thing. The Gilded Age saw a revolution not only in business, but in the way labor and capital interacted. This was a violent era, not merely in raw violence as in unforgiving working conditions and the out-and-out -out battles between labor and owners, but also in how people of the era perceived how you gained access to power and even how you gained a voice in the exercise of power over you. We'll examine more about this in our next module. This then is the end of the lecture, and as always, thank you for your attention.